Um, so as I say, Mark chapter five, um, and keep in mind, we've got these three, you're going to have these three people with these three encounters with Jesus. Um, so let us begin to unpack it. Verse one, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Um, so Jesus and his disciples, they've come across um, the sea to the other side. Uh, and then we read this. And when he, so that's being Jesus, uh, when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Here in the opening of chapter 5, we are introduced to this man of the tombs uh, and it is a a heartbreaking image because here is this man and the first thing we learn about him is that he is uh, he has an unclean spirit within him Uh, he is demon possessed the the bible is very clear that the world we live in is is not just the material but rather there is the spiritual Uh, And not every spiritual thing is good. Um, There are spiritual things which are evil, which are bad, and and that includes unclean spirits or or demons. Um, So this demon um, possesses this man. Um, And there's a few things I want you to to note from this really... um, just heartbreaking scene i mean this is this is a real person and he's being absolutely tormented um and what do we see we see that nobody can bind him nobody can tame him he is literally out of control so people have think about it for a second people have tried to help him people have tried to control him and yet, all their efforts have have failed. We see that he is in the tombs, a place associated with death. Uh, and he is crying out. He is harming himself. I mean, he is in such a dire place. But then Jesus shows up. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. So basically, he sees Jesus from afar, he runs to him, and he basically bows down before him. And it's perhaps interesting that despite this man being demon-possessed, it appears that the demon can't stop him from running to Jesus. Uh, Verse 7, we read this, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. So the evil spirit, now brought before Jesus, knows who Jesus is. And so Jesus says to him in verse 9, then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's another, another, once again, we get another look into just the depth of what this man is going through because he's, he's, it's many demons within him. Legion means many. And in verse 10, also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Let me read this in verse 11. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. 
And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now, we must admit, what a crazy sight that might have been. Right? For, for, for starters, I've never seen 2,000 pigs. Yeah. I don't know about you. I've never seen that many pigs. Secondly, the spirits are sent into them, and then they just run off a cliff and into the sea, and they drown. <laughs> this is definitely not something you see every day, and as you can see by the people and how they react. A couple of things I want you to know, and we could obviously delve into this a lot more, but Jesus gave them permission. I need you to understand, yes, the demonic is real, but Jesus is stronger. You need to understand that. There is never this kind of wrestle with Jesus. They need his permission. They are the ones who are begging him because he is the one who has power. I want that to encourage you, and it should, n- truth like that, basically, yes, we should be aware of that which is spiritually evil. shouldn't be, um, never think about it or never talk about it. But when we do think about it and talk about it, it must always come in view of who we are in Christ and what he has done for us and the fact that he lives inside of us and he is far greater than any demonic power. So yes, we, we, we don't think highly of ourselves, but rather we see the demonic in light of who Jesus is. And the truth is the demonic doesn't stand a chance. And Satan knows his end. And you can read about it in Revelation. It does not end well for him. Jesus is stronger. So what happens after this? Well, verse 14. So the so those who fled, sorry, so those who fed the swine fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. So those who were feeding the swine, it's their job to feed them. You can imagine they're like, what on earth is going on? So they ran off to town and they're like, hey, check it out. You'll never believe what happened. And they explain what happened. And so people come to see. It says verse 15, then they came to Jesus, and I, notice, notice this verse, or highlight this verse, because I, I, I love it. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. afraid. I want you to see the transformation. I want you to see that. The description of the man of the tombs is vastly different to the description that we see here. I mean, it is an incredible change. This man who was demon-possessed and tormented, and now he is sitting, he is clothed in his right mind. I want you to keep that image in mind. Because Jesus has the power to transform lives. In Christ, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Um, been thinking about that uh, recently as I had to speak on it at Reber Street the other day. Um, and one of the things I said to the, the guys at Weber Street was, I can tell you story after story of new creations. And actually, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight in front of me. And then, if you include me, nine. (laughs) I can tell people story after story of people who Jesus has changed. And now we do know that, obviously, when we become a new creation, we're, we're given a new heart, we're given a new identity. He begins to change things straight away. We do know that part of that change is then continuous, right? He doesn't change everything all at once. And there are times where actually the change is more gradual, but I can testify 
of transformed lives because of Jesus. I want that to encourage you. First of all, I want you to acknowledge how the Lord's transformed your life and then celebrate that. Celebrate how the Lord has transformed other people's lives. Let us be reminded Jesus can transform lives. As we see uh, with this man here. Verse 18, And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. I love the response to the demon possessed, isn't it? It's just like, it isn't just that, okay, thanks for the blessing. Thanks for setting me free. I'm off going to do my own life, do my own thing. You know, sometimes we can be guilty, right, of coming to Jesus for the blessing. Coming to Jesus that he can sort whatever situation out in our lives. And then after which we then kind of forget about him. But no, that isn't the case with this man. He's like, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. Tells me that this man has a genuine faith and a love for Jesus. It's like, I want to follow you, Jesus. But then Jesus says this. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. I mean, that is in some ways part of what evangelism is. Go and tell others the great things that the Lord has done for you. And what's the greatest thing the Lord has done for each and every one of us? It is the forgiveness of our sins. It is a relationship, restored relationship with God and the promise of everlasting life. Now, maybe we can pray about how we can word that to people. How we can say, hey, can I tell you that Jesus has forgiven me? He doesn't count my sins against me. Can I tell you, it may sound crazy, but I have a relationship with God. Can I tell you that I'm not afraid of death? Because I know death's not the end. I know I go to be in the presence of Jesus forever and ever. Can I tell you what Jesus has done for me? Can I tell you of the hope that I have, even though I'm struggling right now, or even though there's a weakness in my body right now? Or I'm struggling with this right now. Can I tell you of the hope that I have in Jesus? That there is a new body to come. An eternity with him. So that's our first guy. Right? And that is amazing encounter. So that's the man who was demon possessed. Now we get introduced to our, our next couple of people. Verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea and behold one of the rulers of the synagogue came Jairus by name and when he saw him he fell at his feet so here is Jesus he's crossed back over to the other side um, and now a man named Jairus runs to him so before we had the demon possessed man run before him falls to his knees and now Jairus falls to the at the feet of Jesus and this is what he begs him verse 23 and begged him earnestly saying my little daughter lies at the point of death come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live so here is the the next dire situation we see herself we we find a father and his daughter and his daughter is at the point of death um i can only imagine how difficult that is um if you remember um last year if you remember last year we were we were we were praying as a church along with a load of other people we were praying for um One of my friends, brothers in Christ, um, who we work with at Weber Street, a guy called Daniel, if you remember. Lovely, awesome guy. And if you remember, his little girl, Monet, um, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. uh, And we were praying earnestly um, for them last year. Uh, 
And well, yeah, for what end of actually end of the previous year and last year. Um, and as we know, praise the Lord that the the surgeons were able to remove the tumor and the chemo worked. And she is uh, an awesome, awesome girl. And also, actually, I did forget they actually have um, another child now. They have a a son as well who was born a couple of weeks ago. So that is a uh, another uh, blessing. But um, I remember one particular online prayer meeting uh, that Daniel kind of set up um, for, um, it was being run by his church, the church that he goes to, and they were running, I think it was weekly, uh, if not more than that, prayer meeting where they would just be praying. Um, oh my, Lois says it was daily. So they were praying daily, had like a daily prayer meeting. And me and Lois tuned into one of them. And hearing Daniel pray for his daughter was uh, I don't know if I will ever forget it. It was so, so humbling. So his heart was on his sleeve. Um, actually, we'll be talking about this a bit next week, if you can decipher what book we'll be doing, where next week somebody will be pouring out their soul before the Lord. Uh, and um, Daniel was pouring out his soul before the Lord as we as he was praying and I got the tiniest I got a, just a glimpse of I, what I imagine Jairus is feeling here because um, his daughter's at the point of death and there's nothing he can do and so he's crying out he's like Jesus please he's begging him and as I say, I'm just reminded of those images of Daniel just crying out in prayer, God, please, please help. And he's begging earnestly, please come, please come and, and, and heal her. And so you, you can imagine in verse 24, so Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. So I imagine there is a, uh, some hope being instilled in Jairus. It's like, hey, He's on his way. Cool. Let's go. Let's go. Quick, quick, quick. Let's get, let's get there. I want to, Jesus, please, please, please heal her. And it is while Jesus is en route that we're introduced to our, another person in a dire situation, which is this woman. Verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Uh, here is this woman, and she has this condition, this flow of blood for 12 years. Imagine what you were doing 12 years ago, uh, and then imagine having uh, a weakness in your body, having a condition, uh, having an illness which afflicted you, um, um, she would have been ceremonially unclean, so she would have been cut off a lot from 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 community. She had suffered much during those twelve years, and the physicians they didn't know what to do. Like physicians are a great blessing, um, uh, you know. We have. Family members, Lois's um, brother and sister-in-law are both GPs. Uh, obviously, we know uh, GPs and doctors in our own fellowship. Um, you know, we are, doctors are a great blessing. Um, having the chance to study the body and to, um, to, to, to try and, yeah, try and to help us, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a blessing, that's a gift from God, you know, you think about some of the first hospitals, that were, what, they were pioneered by, by Christians, um, it's a great blessing, but doctors are still, still human, there are still limits to their knowledge, there's still limits to their abilities, um, and in the case, that was the case today, that was the case 2,000 years ago, and, and, and the physicians, they had tried everything, and then in fact, things actually just got worse. So here's this woman with this condition. Nobody else can help, and then she encounters Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, 
For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, Jesus is going to highlight the, the, the great faith that is displayed in that sentence there. She is convinced. If I just, she's convinced that Jesus is so powerful that if I just touch his clothing, I'm going to be made well. Like, that's faith. That's not a, well, I might just see how it goes. It's like, she was convinced. If only I could touch his, his clothes, not even him, not even his skin, just his clothes. If I can touch his clothes, I know I can be made well. And it says in verse 29, immediately, straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Incredible. She's like, I'm convinced if I can just touch Jesus' cloth, I'll be healed. She touches the clothing and suddenly she feels it in her body she's healed. She's healed of her affliction. And Jesus, verse 30, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? <laughs> Jesus can sense power has gone. And, and in some ways, I'm like, uh, somebody once used the illustration of, you know, you know when you, um, you hit your knee, you go to the doctor, they hit your knee and it, it's like a, 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 a reflex action. And they use the, the illustration of, it seems like this is just a reflex action in terms of the power of Christ. That it's just, somebody just touched him with faith and it was just like a reflex. And Jesus knows that power has gone out of him. And so he says, who touched my clothes? And the disciples, like most of us would be, they say this, but his disciples said, uh, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? <laughs> it's quite comical in some ways, isn't it? Imagine, I mean, we Londoners, we know what it's like to be in a crowded place, right? Imagine you're, you're stuck on the tube. You know, imagine if I was with Shamar and we're on the tube in rush hour, pre-COVID, right? You know, you've got your head stuck in somebody's armpit. And imagine me turning to Shamar and being like, hey, bro, who touched me? Who touched me? Right, because there's a crowd here. He's been absolutely thronged. The disciples like, "What do you mean? Who touched you, Jesus? Everybody's touching you." And Jesus like, "No, no, no, no. Jesus knows. It's not. It's not all the other people touching him. This one particular woman who touched him. And he looked around to see her. It says, first verse two. And he looked around to see her, who had done this thing." But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She's like, yeah, I'm sorry, Jesus, that it was, it was me. I touched you. And then look what he says to her. I mean, remember, she's, she is, uh, she's trembling. She's in fear, perhaps thinking that she's done something wrong. And in verse 34, Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. A couple things there. Of course, her daughter, what a lovely address, what a lovely um, approach by Jesus. And it, daughter, your faith has made you well. So go in peace, be healed of your affliction. Here we see a, a woman afflicted by a condition that, that nobody else could solve, and yet Jesus, Jesus was able to. While he was still speaking, so while this is going on, there's this, in essence, you've got rejoicing, but there's also, well, I mean, well, look what happens. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? The unthinkable happens. That which Jairus most feared had taken place 
And now obviously there's there's much description that we don't have, but I imagine he would have been distraught on his knees. I mean, he's just found out that his daughter is dead. They've come to him like, hey, Jairus, she's gone. It's too late. Leave Jesus. Don't trouble him anymore. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. Now, if this was anybody other than Jesus, and I mean this, if this was anybody other than Jesus, this would be highly insensitive, highly inappropriate. I don't worry, just believe, you'll be all right. But this is Jesus we're talking about. This is the God of the universe in flesh. This is the one who is the author of life. He, he and he alone has the right and has, can have the audacity to say this. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Because Jesus has the power to do the impossible. Verse 37. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Once again, that's another audacious thing. Could you imagine turning up, in essence, in the wake of somebody passing away and saying, like, what's the commotion? What's up? Don't worry. She's not dead. She's just asleep. And he gets ridiculed for it, right? Verse 40, and they ridiculed him. Now, the reason why Jesus says she's not dead and is sleeping, she is genuinely dead. But Jesus has the power to raise the dead that it is just as if somebody went to sleep and they rose again. And, I, and, I, and, I do, and that kind of language is used elsewhere in the New Testament, um, used um, by the Apostle Paul when talking about believers who pass away. Because for believers who pass away, death is not the end. It is like going to sleep. Those who have fallen asleep because they will awake. That's the hope we have as believers that when we sleep, we will awake. And it says this, and they ridiculed him, right? But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talifakumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. She was 12 years of age. I don't think that's coincidence. The woman with the flow of blood how long did she have that for 12 years for the life span of this child this 12 year old girl who had passed away jesus took her by the hand and says little girl i say to you arise and she arises She comes back up from the dead. Who would have such power that they could speak and somebody who is dead could come back alive? She was dead. The great enemy, right? The, the great thing everybody wants to try and avoid, right? Why? Because... With all our technological advancement, nobody has found the cure for death. It is very final. It is very final for man, but it's not final for Jesus. 
So here we have these three events, right? We've got a demon possessed man. We have a, a woman who was sick and we had a child who was dead. So taking these three things into account, what is this thread that I want us to kind of go away with? What is this kind of overall theme, this overall truth that I want us to take away? Um, well, to answer that question, I'm going to take you to another point in Scripture. Um, I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 14. Uh, so Genesis 18 uh, and verse 14. Um, and it is this one particular thing uh, which is said um, by the Lord. Um, so Genesis 18, 14. Uh, without going into it too much, um, let me just explain to you kind of the context. Uh, this is when um, free men, free strangers... Um, approach Abraham uh, and they begin to tell him uh, well verse well Genesis 18 um, we read that the Lord appears to Abraham and if you read the account there are three men two of those are, are angels and that gets explained a bit later on and then it stands to reason that the third person is the Lord the Lord appears to Abraham and basically begins to tell Abraham about the son of promise. About how Sarah is going to have a child. And now Sarah is overhearing this. Right? And so we read this. And I might read just a little bit further, just so um, beforehand. Let me just, here we go. Verse 12. No, I tell you what, I'll go from verse 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So basically, if you kind of know the, the account, Abraham and Sarah have not been able to have children for years. And yet God has made this promise, you're going to have a child. Once again, he comes, he explains the promise. No, Sarah is going to have a child. And Sarah's like, Sarah laughs. So Sarah hears this, that she's going to have a child, and she laughs because she's like, well, we've tried before, can't have kids, number one. Number two, I'm old. Number three, he's old as well. <laughs> We're past the age. It's impossible. And so she laughs. And this is what happens next, right? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? So the Lord knows what's going on, calls it out. It's like, Abraham, why is, your, why is your wife laughing? But then he says this, and this is the thing I want us to focus on. Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord. What I want us to take away from this passage in Mark is this. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. We saw in that passage of Mark three impossible situations. There was the man who was demon possessed that nobody could subdue. Nobody could subdue him. Nobody could set him free. There was a woman with a discharge of blood. It was incurable. Physicians and doctors had tried, but they had only made things worse. And then there was Jairus' daughter who was dead, and nobody can reverse death. Three impossible situations. And we ask ourselves the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer to that question is no. 
Nothing is too hard for the Lord. The man demon possessed, not too hard for Jesus. The woman with the incurable condition, not impossible for Jesus. Jairus' daughter, dead, not impossible for Jesus. Now, as we close and as we pray, I want you to take away and be encouraged. Just take away this one question and these examples that display it. And we could point to other examples as well, which is this. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Now, you know me, you know our church. We are not a prosperity preaching church. I'm not going to say, you know, well, you're gonna whatever you desire, whatever you pray for, God's going to give you. As we read through scripture, that, that isn't true. There are some times that we pray and God is more than able, but there are times where he says no. He does so not because he doesn't love us, because the cross is proof that he loves us. But there are moments where he says no, because he has a purpose and he sees things which we don't see, many things which we won't see until eternity. So please don't, don't take this away as kind of a, a license of, hey, whatever I want, God is obligated to do. That is not what I want you to take away. What I want you to take away is this. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. So let us humbly keep that in mind as we do life, as we do ministry, as we do prayer, as we talk to him. And obviously prayer is not just us asking for things. That's part of prayer, not all of prayer. But I want you to be encouraged. There are things which we face which are too hard for us, but they're not too hard for him. And so we entrust ourselves to him. So I want to encourage you. As I say, this is not a prosperity gospel message. This is not a, hey, God's going to do whatever you want him to do. But this is a, no, God is able. May that give us encouragement, humble confidence and encouragement. So I want to ask you, um, Are there situations around you that are too hard for you? I want you to ask this question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Are there there things not just outside, externally, perhaps there are things internally? Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. Nothing is too hard for him. Let us pray. Uh, And I think what we'll do is perhaps we can even spend our time praying for some of those things which we're like, man, this is just hard. Um, As I say, I I know I keep repeating it, but I I just like to stress it. Jesus isn't like a genie. We rub the lamp and he does whatever we want. But he is a God who hears and he's a God who is able. So may that give us confidence when we pray. May that give us confidence to keep praying about certain situations, to keep investing perhaps in certain people, not because we have the power, but because God is able, because nothing is too hard for him. So I want you to pray. uh, Well, I'll pray now and then uh, just maybe spend some time just in groups, um, just praying um, about some of those things which you're like, man, some of the areas, basically, some of the areas where we need to ask ourselves the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Uh, let's pray. Um, and then you can break out to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the reminder that nothing is too hard for you. And yes, Lord, we know that as we come to Scripture, we're not guaranteed a pain-free life. I mean, that's what we've been learning in, in Peter. Like, as, as believers, we will at times suffer. That is true. But Lord, may that not diminish our grasp and our understanding that you are a God who is able. That you are a God who is able to do the impossible. And I pray that that would give us hope. 
Lord, I pray that we would keep bringing to, keep asking ourselves that question, which the Lord said to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? Lord, may you just uh, just impress this on our heart this year and beyond, that we would keep coming back. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. And we would answer with a resounding no. Nothing is too hard. The demon-possessed man was not too hard for the Lord. The woman with the incurable condition was not too hard for the Lord. The girl who was dead is not too hard for the Lord. And Lord, we thank you that even above all these things, you have done the hardest thing, which was to reconcile us to yourself. The hardest thing of bridging the gap between man and God. The hardest thing of dealing with our sin, of issuing both love and justice at the same time. Lord, you have done the hardest things. And therefore we have hope, not just for now, but even greater than that. We have hope for eternity. 70, 80, 90, 100 years pales in comparison to eternity. So Lord, give us your view of things. Give us your heart for things. I pray that we would leave today with an enlarged picture of how able you are, Lord Jesus. I ask this in your name. Amen.